<laughs> there we all are. <laughs> Stopping the share. Well, welcome to everybody who is here today from all of many places in the world, from uh, the US, oh. from Argentina, from um, from uh, Lebanon, but in in uh, Paris and Australia, and I may have missed some places where I don't know people. Before we start, I'd just like to uh, do a welcome to country. We respectfully acknowledge the wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their custodianship of the lands and waterways. The lands on which uh, Spinifex offices are situated are uh, Jiru, Banarong and Wurundjeri, Wadawurrung, Aora and Noongar. And we also acknowledge the many women throughout history who have fought for women's freedom and the freedom of lesbians, often at the cost of their lives. And that sound in the background is my dog, our <laughs> Nala, who is complaining. And when I'm not speaking, I will consequently turn my sound off. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, she usually doesn't talk during launches, but here you go. Uh, Phyllis Chesler is Emerita Professor of Psychology and Women's Studies and the author of 20 books, including Women and Madness and most recently Requiem for a Female Serial Killer. She's co-founder of the Association for Women in Psychology and the National Women's Health Network. She has also written extensively about honor killing. Over to you, Phyllis. Thank you for the wonderful introduction and what a pleasure to be together. Cross <laughs> bodies of water, cross many, many decades, if not centuries. It's an honor to be here and we're still here. And I don't stop in the very early, maybe 1970, 71, I was calling for a feminist air force to rescue the women who would be on a killed in Bangladesh, without doubt, because I had once myself been held captive in a marriage in Kabul. Now, what am I working on for the last six, seven days? I'm working on trying to rescue a single Afghan feminist from Kabul. The only way out is on a military transport. We still do not have one airplane that can land on sovereign feminist soil. I'm just saying. So I've gone for some sleepless nights in this difficult and crucial attempt to free just one woman, just one. So, I know that the panelists here, um, Max Dashu has resurrected images of the goddess and their wonderful images. And Peggy Lures has a wonderful line. Time passes swiftly now. Oh, it's true. Yet I move slower. Oh, how true that is. And her question is, when did lesbians get expelled from the movement that starts with the letter L? We blinked and women's liberation and second wave feminists were underground and unseen. And younger feminists don't know their history and don't have much respect for older feminists. And Cheris, who I'm happy to meet for the first time, um, I know your encyclopedia and uh, the systematic disappearance of feminist knowledge is the theme. It was of, of Dale Spender's very important book. And I saw it, I'm sure we all have seen it happen again in our lifetimes. The work of the late 60s to the mid 70s, maybe up until the late 70s, gone by the mid 80s, not taught in universities, not taught in medical schools, uh, not passed out on street corners, forgotten and neutralized and jettisoned and um, 
I don't know what to say about the incomprehensible weird crap language that now passes for feminist interpretations of weighty themes that have little to do with women and that are not woman centered, even if they're quote queer, not woman centered, we're gone. And to Megui, the Argentinian women meant a lot to me, their purity, their bravery. And yes, rape is torture and it is a war crime. And it is now not just a spoil of war, but um, it, it's a weapon of war. It's used, I called it gender cleansing as it happened in the Sudan, for example. And the struggle that we waged against prostitution and pornography did not triumph in the universities. It did not triumph in the media or at the United Nations, really, it didn't. So that struggle continues. And so in speaking to a younger feminist, I decided to call my contribution, never the victory, only the struggle. That's all we can count on. Perhaps each other and the struggle, not victory in our lifetimes. And I write about this in my piece and I end it in a way that I ended a politically incorrect feminist, which got me into, I always get into trouble. If, you tell, if a woman tells the truth, it's not just that the world splits open, it's that she gets out of, she gets targeted, smeared, uh, shunned, and ridden out of town on a rail, and forgotten, and buried. That's what happens if you tell the truth. And we have absolutely no alternative but to do so. So I, um, I wouldn't have missed this revolution, not for anything, not for love, not for money. And uh, I was so ill-prepared for the life that I was destined to leave. So angels, angels must have watched over me. I can offer no better explanation for why I survived and flourished. For more than half a century, I've been a soldier at war. I'd say since the early 60s, really, but not as a, uh, a figure in the troops until 1967. I carry scars, we all do, all warriors do. And most of us were felled daily, both by our opponents and by friendly fire. Still, still, wouldn't have missed this, not for the world. What a privilege to be part of this. And I'm looking for how I briefly, briefly paraphrased the ending of a politically incorrect feminist. And I have the volume in my hands now, our volume. Um, nope, it's not here. I paraphrased um, from Henry, from Shakespeare, because any woman who was not among us, when she hears us speak of our battles and our bravery, will wish she had been with us and will be quiet will be quiet. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Phyllis. Um, I'm now, I, I should have done an introduction at the beginning with Renata and I, but we'll do that at the end instead. <laughs> um, so our next speaker is Peggy Lourdes. She's coming to us from Vermont. She is a lifelong activist for women's rights and even built her own home. I mean, that's extraordinary. She spent a dec decade as director of the Burlington Women's Council and developed training for women in the trades. She has taught ecology and feminism at the Institute for Social Ecology and helped set up Women Against Rape and worked on the Common Woman newspaper. So, Peggy, your turn. All right. Um... It's amazing to be here with all these women. Uh, Phyllis, your work has been so important to me. Uh, women in Madness was very, very, saved my life early on in my lesbian coming out. Um, anyway, but I was thinking about 
um, I, I guess I say in my piece something about how I hate that trope that you hear in advertising and on the television. This is not your mother's this or that, or not your father's, you know, like that's that's the most important thing that it couldn't be. And 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 I was thinking about what it, how ageism is such a potent weapon of divide and conquer because it cuts us off from generations. And and I, I was thinking about what imagine, you know it's been so painful to have these young women who are almost like a counterinsurgency to feminism, you know, being pro-porn, pro-prostitution, pro-trans, and, um, and, and what it would be like, what a wonderful thing it would be, you know, so we're dividing mothers and daughters and grandmothers and what, it, imagine how incredible it would be if we were united, if we had the wisdom and the tactics of the older women and the energy and the knowledge of the zeitgeist of the younger women, and we work together. But I did want to mention, because I saw this this morning and it was really heartening to me, um, women, um, the Michigan Women's Music Festival, which is something I attended a lot. In fact, several years I worked there as a carpenter, mostly building accessibility toilets and ramps and so on. Um, oh, that, so, so there was something called the Michigan Family Reunion, which a lot of women got together in Michigan on the same land that the festival had been had, and much smaller. But what was, what was wonderful to read this morning was a young woman saying, how incredible it had been for her to be in this space that for the it was it sounded almost as though the first time in her life people listened to her and cared about her and she particularly she talked about you know being moved to tears when they were singing amazon women and not only because of the joy of it but because she felt like she was being let into this secret society and this history and she was being welcomed into it and i just thought that was a wonderful thing to read and it would be lovely if we had more of that you know we really had you know had ways to welcome women in and they were open to it so um in the last bunch of years um i've i've been retired i i did spend 10 years as uh the head of the burlington women's council when i started bernie sanders was the mayor um and that was for about a year or two and um i did get it was kind of wonderful because uh one of the things that women rarely get to do is look at the big picture and plan ahead. I mean, we've had rape crisis centers and battered women's shelters, and those are always in crisis mode. So the Women's Council had membership, it had at-large members, but it also had members from all the various women's groups. So we had people from really radical groups and some, and even, you know, the, the business and professional women. So we had a, a wide, span of women but what was wonderful and that women so seldom get to do is that we got to work together plan together and and map out larger strategies like getting women into the trades we tried to institute um a new uh a program against violence against women but we didn't get as far with that or i mean they wouldn't let us in the schools and to do the plans that we had but we did we were very successful around women in the trades uh we we wanted to find something that would actually take women out of poverty and the the trades women you know had the possibility to make more money and prior to that i had um been I I came out as a lesbian in 1973 before that I was in a CR group and in early on I was part of uh women against rape this someone just gave me this recently our old thing women against rape which was war and then it became the women's rape crisis center and now it calls itself hope works just to make sure you know I mean I was told one of the things that I did manage to do when I was um, um, the director of the Women's Council was to get the city to pay for self-defense classes for women and girls. And, um, and then when I left that position after a lot of, after a certain betrayal, but anyway, when I left that position, the city was still willing to give the money 
to do that. And I could not get the Rape Crisis Center to accept it. They told me that um, they weren't strident like I was and my group were. But as far as I can tell, it was mostly my cohort who accomplished all of this. So life has been um, retired, has been nice. And I started a group uh, just before, uh, it's in my story, just before the lockdown, we had started a group called Gender Critical Vermont. I don't even like the words gender critical now, but it, it, Vermont has one of the worst laws. It has a law saying that uh, transgender surgery can be done on anybody, no lower age limit, which I think is a terrible law. And the young woman who introduced that now wants to introduce uh, um, legalizing prostitution. And I've opposed that. And so I've been told, well, I'm wrong on all the issues, aren't I? I mean, where we would agree is that we don't want prostituted women to be criminalized. But um, I'd, you know, I, I favor the Nordic model and not, and I know the facts of, you know, legalized prostitution is not a good thing. So I loved, um, I saw Phyllis do that whole um, interpretation of the Henry Henry's speech in at uh, Kate. I saw it online at Kate Millett's memorial, and I feel very much like that. That I wouldn't have missed it for anything. It's not been easy. I I was raked over the coals when I left my position as the women's council. People tried to destroy my reputation. They did a fair job of it, but um, I bounced back from that. And more recently, I've had to deal with uh, being persona non grata for my position of not, not you know, of, of knowing that um, you can't really change sex. And I was, I, I, I was trying to go to a, a thing for a colleague and I was met by three police cars called called by the Peace and Justice Center. I guess that was their idea of nonviolent communication to keep me from this. Um, most of the women walked out with me, but um, and that's just kind of where we are now. But um, I do see that beginning to change and I and I am connecting with different women and uh, We'll continue. I just can't imagine, you know, I just think it's really important. We're in a, a tremendous struggle. And I think that uh, we just, we have, to, well, the way we have to look at it is, 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 is to recognize it as testament to our power. When, the real thing that, that they can't stand is women bonding, women getting together. And I know, and we all know, you know, that that's not simple. That's one of the things I watch with young women. They're, they're shocked that women can be difficult and nasty to each other. And, uh, you know, it's like, I just want to say to them, well, radical feminism has never been an easy path. I mean, it's, I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I'm certainly glad I took it, but it's not easy. And, and you have to have, you know, you have to have a little, you have to have some courage and some persistence to stick with it because it isn't easy. And I always liked, um, remembering what uh, Flo Kennedy, a wonderful black woman, who was one of the first people I saw in the women's movement when I still lived in New York, saying that if you think power corrupts, try powerlessness. And I, th I think that's something that we have to understand when we're dealing with horizontal hostility. That's kind of a lot of where it comes from, that sense of powerlessness. And when you, when you have a little, then often it's the person next to you that, uh, is being attacked. So um, I encourage young women. For a while, I worked with a whole group of young women, and we did some wonderful stuff. They got themselves, they got a, 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 a really nasty rapist frat off of campus, and they, they got on the Dr. Drew show to talk about it. But then they all went to some conference where they took Transgender 101, and they came back wanting to do that. And I just, I just said, well, I'm not up for that. And I will, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do that. You should do, you, you need to do what you need to do. And they, they kind of fell apart off that, but we did Good do some you. great work for two Good years. Good on you for that. <laughs> huh? What'd Good you say? You. Good on you for doing that. 
Yeah, it was it was great for a while it lasted, but uh, unfortunately, you know, and again, I mean, that's what I have seen mostly. The thing that has made me most anxious to work around this is the fact that that what I've seen it do is destroy so many um, organizations, you know, tear them apart like OLAC. And the other thing, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is that I, I was shocked to realize, I mean, it, it took me a while to realize that radical feminism was really gone. And I had decided what I would do is teach it online. I do have a regular TV show that I've done, a local access I've done for, I don't know, 12, 15 years now. And a couple of them are on YouTube. But one of the things that inspired me there was I was reading, was looking at some of the reading and looking at um, detransitioners um, stories. And several of them mentioned finding radical feminism and understanding there was another way they could look at their lives. We have a book about the transition coming up in a couple of months. So hopefully that will also help to get the word out. And it's somebody who was uh, very much assisted by coming to radical feminism. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's, that's fantastic. Um, Evelyn. Evelyn Ackard is coming to us from Paris tonight, although she lives in Beirut, Lebanon, and was born and raised there. She is Professor Emerita at the University of Illinois and the Lebanese American University and has taught comparative literature, African studies, women's studies, French and Middle Eastern studies. Among her books is The Wounded Breast, Intimate Journeys Through uh, cancer, which is published by Skin Effects in English. Uh, and she is co founder of Bait El Hanan, a women's shelter in Beirut. And today is the anniversary of the explosion in Beirut last year. Thank you, Thank Evelyn. You. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, for to contribute to the book and also uh, to be with you and talk about the other concerns that we have among feminists all over the world. And I'm so touched to be with all of you here. I have read many of your books and have been very moved uh, with many of them, uh, Women and Madness, of course, and also uh, uh, Sherry's Cremary's books and Susan, uh, Hawthorne's books and Renat. I mean, I feel very, very honored to be with you. I must say that it has been a very difficult day for me watching. I, I watch too much uh, all the things that have happened uh, in Beirut and all this uh, commemoration, uh, uh, remembrance of what happened last year. I was, I thought I was dead. <laughs> so, so when I was asked, to contribute to a book not dead yet. <laughs> I, I wrote about not feeling that I was, I had died and then I was, but no, I was not dead yet. And so my, the, what I wrote for the, for the book was, uh, was about this experience, but actually <laughs> later I realized that no, I should have written about my, uh, my struggle as a feminist. Maybe I can do that uh, in an, for another book, for another volume of your books about how I left Lebanon when I was 19, running away from arranged marriage, my condition as a woman, reaching New York with $5 in my pocket and, uh, and then discovering Simone de Beauvoir and all the feminist writing and Nawal Saadawi, of course, which I will talk about a little later. And, and feeling very, uh, uh, all of a sudden realizing that what I had left was nothing compared to what many of the women suffered all over the world. And that was made me really conscious and then uh, made me want to, I toured Africa and the Middle East to, to question uh, women, to find out about the plight, the women's movements in those countries I have a book on the women's movement in Tunisia, which is one of the countries that's very alive uh, in terms of, uh, of women's, uh, women's issues. And so I, I wrote about the, their movement. And then also, uh, especially, I was very concerned about excision when I read about excision. So I wrote about genital mutilation. And so I, I, uh, I questioned a lot of the 
the doctors and the women uh, throughout the uh, Arab Peninsula and uh, Africa, uh, especially uh, Egypt and Sudan concerning these issues. And um, then recently I went back to Lebanon after I retired from the University of Illinois to, to, because I was, uh, I founded this shelter for abused women with my sister in Beirut. And I've been going back there for humanitarian purposes. And that's when I got caught last year in the, in, I lived with my nine, uh, 90, <laughs> uh, no, yes, 96, 97, 98 years old aunt above the port in Beirut when, uh, and I saved her life because we were, when there were two explosions and the first explosion, we were on the balcony and she, I saw this fire coming out and I said, you, you'd better go in. And I put her on a, on a chair where she was protected by a wall. And I went to close the windows and I got thrown on the floor with a whole pan of window on my head and on my back and, and, and I thought I was dead. And uh, anyway, so this has been the struggle. And uh, we all know that as women, we have, we have to go through many struggles and, uh, and yet we are here and we, are, we, have, we feel a sense of solidarity among us. And this is what keeps us going. And I would like to sing one of my songs that, Nawasada, we always ask you to sing, to bring my guitar and sing. And I've composed songs ever since the war started in 1975 in Lebanon. I had never written songs before and somehow it came out, the music and the words uh, came out because of my suffering and it was very catharsic. And Nawasada, we always ask me to sing and uh, to bring my guitar and sing. And I wrote this song actually with her in mind. So I'll just, if you allow me to end with a, a short uh, excerpt of, of the song uh, that I wrote and for all of us, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. My our dog started to sing along with you at the end. <laughs> and you can see she's still going. Um, you can hear that. Okay, so Max, Max Dashu, um, she founded the Suppressed Histories Archive in 1970. If you haven't been to it, please do. Uh, she has a collection of 50,000 images and has created and presented hundreds of slideshows that universities, 
bookstores, festivals, schools, and libraries. She's the author of oh. Witches and Pagan Women in European Folk Religion, as well as uh, Pythia, Melissae, and Pharmakides, uh, Women in Hellenic Culture. Max, uh, you will see behind Max uh, the marvelous poster that she has done too. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. And so wonderful to have a little taste of music there that, you know, just the whole spectrum of what what we all bring to the table, all the arts and, and expressions of feminist women. I'm coming to you from Huchun, uh, the territory of the Ohlone people in California and pay my respects to the, their sovereignty and their ancestors. Um, yeah, where we, where we stand now at this time, it's, it's very strange. Most of us have spent half a century fighting for women's liberation. And we find ourselves again having to recenter core issues of especially around oppression on the basis of sex, the colonization of women's bodies on a whole range, in a whole range of ways. We're, we're fighting again for procreative rights. Women's abortion rights are under severe threat in not just in the United States, but especially there with the fundamentalist uh, core that's going on in so many places. And of course, as Susan and Renata and others have highlighted surrogacy, various ways of colonizing access to women's bodies, either for reproductive or sexual access. And, you know, as Peggy was saying, there's this contestation going on of basic feminist positions, you know, that women have self-determination. We have the right to self-determination in every sphere. But, you know, the body is a focus of this. And this is something with the shift from gen sex to gender has really been sidelined. That, that material oppression. And this is something that, you know, we're, we're having to look at the way women's boundaries are being challenged and the contestations of women's speech very much in view. Our ability to analyze, to name, to define out of our own voices. This was core to what we were doing. It was why we were, we were facing a wall of opposition back in 1969, and we are finding it renewed under different rationales now. And from institutional levels, sometimes institutions that we founded, that we created. And so this is very serious. Uh, I had a episode last week, you know, it's the, the cortisol bath that we all go through periodically of defending JK Rowling from the waves of death threats that have been lobbed at her, continue to be lobbed at her. And I had, you know, a bunch of people I'd never heard of march onto my page to tell me I was trans misogynist for doing so. And, and that wasn't even the topic of the post. It was simply, it is not right. It can never be defended to do it like that to any woman, to, to vilify her and especially to threaten her, the menacing that is causing so many women to fall into silence. So those are some of the concerns that I think also I would just mention the return of the stigma on lesbians, which has happened. And this again comes to a boundaries issue of women's right to same sex love. And you know, that's been something where, you know, where we're really seeing that a lot of assaults happening on that front. So as to the women's history insurgency that I wrote about in my piece. This has really, you know, been the focal point of my activism because I think that patriarchy, well, I know that patriarchy demoralizes women and we need access to knowledge about how things can be different, how things have been different, female spheres of power in a really global view. It's not Queen Elizabeth I feminism. It's not, you know, these very narrow spectrums that we were given little, little tastes of in, in kind of a packaged way but to really look internationally at the full cultural record. And the Suppressed Histories Archives just got its nonprofit status this year. And the first undertaking is to take, to make accessible internationally and digitally the entire body of work 
uh, there's 10,000 posts that I need to uh, make uh, navigation pages so people can find the content. Eventually we're gonna tag it all for searchability, but I'm in the process of creating a series of videos using the page banners that I've made over the past several months that indicate the topic areas. And these are both you know, patriarchy and racialized caste and so many different subjects like that, you know, the heavy stuff, the oppression stuff, but also the global heritages of, of women's self-determination, female spheres of power, the medicine women and the women warriors and the matriarchs. And so that's going to be available. The first video is already up on the Suppress Histories YouTube channel. So you can look for that. And I'm gonna be creating three more of those. And that'll give you a little taste of what that resource will be. Um, that's really, and also the places. So another angle of the organization, the site architecture is going to be by geographic areas. And so, you know, all the continents and regions will eventually, and, and eventually in time as well by countries and peoples. So that there are different angles of approach. And so that's going to be a resource, I hope, for women to access this information, which has been systematically excised, omitted, sequestrated, and, and to really give women a broader view because part of our colonization has been not knowing. And as Gerda Lerner laid out so well, feminists have had to reinvent the wheel generation after generation, century after century, rediscovering these, these important these important things that other women have done and they think they're the only ones. And this is part of the divide and conquer strategy, the process of isolation and even shunning that women who contest patriarchal power are subjected to or any other form of domination. So I lost track of the time, that's probably enough. But um, oh, I'll just say one last thing about age is that I'm now 70 going on 71 and I'm finding rather than slowing down as people are expected to do in their elderhood, I have to accelerate. There's too much to be done. And you know the urgency is greater than ever. So no, no rest for the weary, but that's all right because you know we are battle hardened by this time and never say die. Thank you. Thanks so much, Max. And if you want to go to the website, um, it's www.suppressedhistories, that's with a hyphen in between, .teachable.com for the videos that Max is producing. Okay, now we move to Buenos Aires uh, and we catch up with uh, Margui Bellotti. She is a lawyer, lesbian feminist abolitionist and member of the group Asociación de Trabajo y Estudio de la Mujer. Uh, which is, can be shortened to ATEM. Uh, she was an editor of the magazine Brujas and has been widely published internationally. Her most recent book is Prostitution and Trafficking, Tools of Abolitionist uh, Struggle. And later in the question time, Estelle Dish uh, will help with translating for Margui. Um, she is a photographer who does digital transformations and you can see her work on several of our books, especially the Spinifex Shorts series. She taught uh, sociology for 40 years, mostly at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and she travels regularly to Argentina and she translated Magui and Marta's uh, contributions and also wrote her own essay. Over to you, Margui. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, I'll read uh, because my English is not good. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks and congratulations to Renata and Susan of Stimkit Press on the publication of Not That Yet for, and for uh, 30 years on feminist publishing. It's made me happy to know that many of us older feminists are still alive and that our ideas, our passion, our struggles continue. In my article, I begin by saying that I came to feminists at the age of 29, 
during the genocidal dictatorship in Argentina. I brought with me many years of leftist militancy, my love for women, and a lot of grief thanks to the support of my mother and my older sister. In those hard dictatorship years, surrounded by death, I embraced feminine, I fell in love, I stayed close to news and old friends, and I began to identity, identity, no, excuse, excuse me, to identify as a lesbian, no longer homosexual or bisexual. It was also in those years that the mothers of Plaza de Mayo, those women who inspired us with their incredible courage, courage and creativity, began the weekly protests in search of their children disappeared by the dictatorship. During the dictatorship, we formed a small study group, clandestine meetings in feminist women's houses. And after a few years, in 1992, seven women formed an autonomous feminist group, APAM, Asociación de Trabajo y Estudios de la Mujer, November 25. My life partner, Marta Fontenla, and I were among the founders of this group. Marta also has an insight not yet and talks about this beginning, our history, and the role APA am played in both the Argentine feminist movement and the Argentine women's movement. We united in a common struggle with the wow. women's wow. movement, even yes, even though we didn't always share feminist ideas. The main focus of our attention has always been violence against women and patriarchal terrorism. We quickly realized how the state terrorism of the dictatorship fight on male terrorism. The intersection of human rights and, and women's rights became clear. This version of feminists born and reborn in the midst of the struggle against the dictatorship also appears in the article in Not the Yet by Consuelo Rivera Fuentes, a former political Christian and lesbian who talks about feminist women's group created in Chile during the dictatorship of Pinochet. From our connection with the Argentina human rights movement, especially with the mother of Plaza de Mayo, and with the relatives detainees disappeared for political reasons, emerged our friendship friendship with Argentina, Richard Vitti, and her United States born partner, Esther Vich. Esther also has a piece in this book describing how she carried on Rita's work after Rita's death. We were introduced to each other by Rene Eppelbaum, an activist with the mothers of Plata de Mayo, and we all became friends. The intimate relationship between feminists and human rights today may produce in international conventions is essential to many of our struggles, including the abolition of prostitution, our demands for the appearance of women disappeared but by prostitution network, our commitment to legal reforms aimed at ensuring that the consent of the victim is not to be taken into account in crimes of trafficking and sexual exploitation. Our commitment to penalizing pimps and shams, whom we call puteros, and the restitution of women's rights of women's rights and support that will allow them to leave prostitution. Our analysis of prostitution also includes its relationship to the imposition of heterosexuality, 
understood as an obligatory institution for women and as a definition of feminine. Abolitionist, lesbian exist existence, and human rights are all part of the same theoretical and political perspective and are a vital commitment of ours. This perspective disagrees with patriarchal and neoliberal positions that claim prostitution as free choice or work, and also disagrees with those who separate lesbians from feminists. This perspective also disagrees with the trend to symbolically disappear women in a proliferation of identities in which our struggles and our very existence as women are deleted. We maintain that women are neither objects nor merchandise, and no merchandise. The prostitution is an extreme form of violence against women and that lesbians are a necessary part of the long march of women towards justice. Thank you. I hope I hope you understand my words. Yes, yes. And thank you so very much uh, for doing all the extra work that's involved in speaking your non-native language. <laughs> um, <laughs> our, our next uh, speaker is Sheris Cramere. Oh, I just should mention that Consuelo will participate in the next launch coming, uh, the, the UK Eurasia launch. Um, who you mentioned from Chile. Uh, okay, Sheris is the author, editor or co-editor of 12 books dealing with education, language, online education and new media. With Dale Spender, she co-edited the four volume International Encyclopedia of Women, which involved more than 2000 authors and advisors. She was Director of Women's Studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and also an International Dean at the International Women's University, which was held in Germany. Thank you, Sheris. Oh, thank you. And what a delight it is to be with this group <laughs> of people. Uh, and, and just to thank, um, you know, uh, Susan Renata, uh, the founders of Spinifex uh, Press, 30 years of feminist publishing, and all the connections over time, space, topics that um, you have been responsible for. In, in my entry in um, Not Dead Yet, I wrote of some of the immense achievements of earlier feminists, as well as their sense of humor, their passion, disagreements, disruptive actions, and of some of the attempts to disrupt, ignore, deny what feminists have said and done through the years. Um, Phyllis mentioned uh, Dale Spender and her book, Women of Ideas and What Men Have Done to Them, and talks about the ways that women as thinkers and speakers have been rendered invisible, reduced to stereotypes, ridiculed, trivialized, demeaned, and, and Max founding the Suppressed History Archives. Well, this is the, the, the stuff that I have just um, really been so thankful for, what has happened before even we started. We're the old ones, but before we um, worked. Dale Spender in that brilliant book, Women of Ideas and What Men Have Done to Them. And Dale Spender is kind of there in the, in the volume in a variety of ways. A lot of people re referenced her. She wrote that in 1983. And as the speakers here today have been talking about, it's happened again, how women have been, how women of ideas and what men, institutions, what, what has happened again to the words of actions of women in the so-called second wave. I've read accounts of what we said and did um, and what we missed and got wrong. And of course we did miss things and get some things wrong. But so many contributions and achievements have been missed and gotten wrong by contemporary critics. And I think that's what a lot of people have been talking about. Um, so I just wanted to um, talk about a few of the things that I was involved with that tried to also um, uh, assert 
are the presence of women that coming even before uh, before us. Um, and a few visual aids. Um, this is a, a, a book that um, the Radical Women's Press of the 1850s, and that is 1850s, the Radical Women's Press of the 1850s. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had called a, a, con a women's, the first women's rights uh, convention in the US uh, in 49, uh, 1849. And then women started publishing their own newspapers. And I found one by chance in an archive. Um, I found, um, and then and then looking at more, uh, Anne Russell and I found um, additional seven women's newspapers that were published in the 1850s, not in any of the history books I read, not in the journalism books. And they were working for some of the same things that people are working on now. Um, in addition to the abolition of slavery, they were trying to change the damage of women, of men's accounts of history, husbands battering of, of, of women, um, women's economic poverty, restrictions on women's movement and unhealthy fashions, what were required. Um, so their words have been distorted, dismissed or denied by a great many cultural experts. We know this. Um, and yet women's rights was at the forefront of their agenda. They wanted to uh, redefine women as human, worthy, competent, and active creators. And then in um, 1868, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, with the help of hundreds of contributors, published the newspaper, The Revolution, a national newspaper in the US, national. And it is one of the important, most important radical periodicals of Western women's movement. It can't be matched today, I think, for its exhilarating ambition, wit, radical analysis. And we added a book with some of, of their words. But again, kind of discovered quite by chance, it's not in the history books. Um, and then I've also looked at some of the wonderful periodicals that um, early femi feminist, second wave feminists uh, have published. I mean, and some of the people here today were involved in some of those journals. Um, you know, the titles like Leaping Lesbian, Shameless Hussy, Scarlet Woman, Women, Scarlet Letter, Goodbye to All That, A Change is Going to Happen, Broadsheet, Tooth and Nail, Hysterical, No More Fun Than Games. A lot of really badass publications. And there's a real education out there for anyone who wants to go looking at at the words in the analysis in those works. And then again, trying to research the wit and wisdom of thousands of these and other women. Uh, Paula Tricler and I did a feminist dictionary recognizing women as linguistically creative speakers. Of course, we know that most dictionaries ignore the linguistic creative creativity of women, rendering them invisible. And most dictionaries are also very sexist. Um, but our dish is a dictionary of feminist thought and word making. And, you know, we, we had a good time working on that in, in feminist archives um, in many countries and many places. Um, and we played around sometimes with ourselves with entries. Most of them were the words of women in, in publications and in speeches and, and through a hundred years. But we also played around with entries such as rubbish garbage put out by men. So again, a lot of linguistic creativity that it, it, has, it doesn't have another, it's out of print, uh, of course, no. And then um, Phyllis Hall, who is represented in the, in the volume, um, helped us start um, Rutledge, this uh, encyclopedia, Encyclopedia of um, Rutledge Encycl uh, International Encyclopedia of Women, Global Women's Issues and Knowledge. And we didn't have a, a lot of guides on how to do an encyclopedia. So we did it all, we did, it's a very collective uh, involving, as um, Susan said, uh, thousands of women. Um, and it's an index with thousands of topics. It's a place to begin almost any study, I think, of our lives and, and, and environment. Um, so in sum, I just encourage everyone to have a first or second look at the words and actions of radical feminists. 
that's been going on for a long time, despite all kinds of attempts to deny, dismiss, distort um, this, this rebellion. So many women have dared so much and suffered so much to bring about social equality. Brave feminist act, activists of the past, and they can provide all of us with some, with some good, good lessons for today in our own work. And you know, as Evelyn says, we are here, we're still here um, in good part because of our collective work it's not that we agree on everything, but we have really tried to work collectively in a variety of ways. Um, and I just thank Spinaflex for bringing new attention to some of these fiercely serious, smart, and often wisely humorous uh, women that are represented in the pages. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Sheris. You mentioned the word disruption. I see that the word disruption has become popular, but of course, feminists have been doing it for decades. And there is a, a woman in the UK, Beck Wonders, who's doing uh, research on women's magazines of the 1970s. So the research is happening. Now, I owe an apology to Renata because this book was Renata's idea. Uh, and as well as that, we were meant to start the session, but since we didn't, we're going to. Um, Renata is now going to talk about Not Dead Yet and why it had to happen. Thank you, Susan. Yes, I was wondering what, what happened to the introduction, but that's all right. And I really don't have to actually say why we wanted to do this book, because Sherry's, um, Phyllis, Max, uh, everybody, in fact, has actually said why this book needed to happen. Uh, there, really, there are really two main aims of the book. One is to clean up a little bit about the distortion um, that has happened of all our words. Uh, and of course, there's many more that we could have done. And when I hear, when I listen to Sherry's talking about, what was it, 2000 authors? <laughs> we suffered enough <laughs> with 56 authors. I don't know how you actually survived that, but you did. And all, you know, thank you so much to you for this decades long uh, work to put together this encyclopedia. So yes, yeah, so first thing is to clear up some of the uh, misinformation about what women in the 60s and 70s and 80s really did. And very importantly, hopefully, then to have this information available for young women today. And I have to say so far, uh, we've done a few interviews, Susan and I, um, with young uh, women, there were radio interviews in Australia, and um, basically they were blown away by the book. And, and say they had just simply no idea that all of thing, these things happened. And it's obviously only a very, very uh, a snapshot of what we could have put in. And we did forget Maya, uh, our culpa actually, to invite um, a few women that we should definitely all also have included. Uh, but Jana Hammer from the UK that many of you know, we did invite her, but she was a bit sick at the time, and so that didn't happen. But there are a few others that um, we. But on the good side of things, we have already received two extra contribution, as we indicate at the end of our introduction, and they will go up on a blog um, that is going to be attached on the Spinifex website to Not Did Yet. So, um, Susan, did you want to say something more about how we actually did the book? Well, I must say, when we came up with the 50s, well, we probably came up with about 60 women to ask. Um, and uh, we got a huge number of responses really, really quickly. And as anybody who has done an anthology knows, usually you have to go in and remind lots of people. Um, and the, the contributions don't come very fast. Well, some of them came even before the deadline. So that was quite extraordinary. Um, we also then had to figure out um, what, how we would put it together, what order would the pieces appear in. So um, it was a bit of a mix of like, uh, so how can we open the book? How can we close the book? 
what should be somewhere in the middle and then we clustered things around that and we made sure that that the poems that are part of it are also in different parts of the book and so a lot the pieces eventually all bounced off one another it was very satisfying to do it and then we had to write an introduction and I thought oh my god how are we going to do this so I started it uh, and I, I kind of had the same process as putting it together and tried to find commonalities and differences between the, um, the essays. And then I gave it to Renata and she improved it enormously. And as I said at the previous launch, we have discovered again that we're a great team. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it's a lot of after 30 years. We should, true. but it's nice to have it reinforced. Yes. And it was, I mean, it was a lot of work, but it was also a lot of fun doing it. And having the different launches is also proving to be lots of fun. And um, I think that will probably do for now. Oh, one thing I did want to say, just like the book. Uh, it's interesting uh, in terms of what you're all saying. I noticed that there are references to other women who um, either aren't in the book or are in the book, um, like Nawal El Sadawi, like Dale Spend, like Consuelo, and and others, Consuelo Rivera Fuentes. So these these um, crossovers occur within the book and within the launches. So it's really wonderful to see that. Thank you. Um, so our next thing is, if you are a contributor and you would like to say uh, a few words as well, there is a section down the bottom uh, called reactions where you can put up your hand uh, and I will then have to scan through. Or you could say, uh, just speak might be easier. Um, yes, you'd like to speak because then the screen will come up for me. Now, I know that uh, among the other contributors, there's Diane Bell, Karen Higgs, Jean Taylor, Marta Fontenla, Cheryl Adam, and Cora uh, uh, Corazon from, sorry, I'm having a blank. Sorry, Cora. <laughs> um, Corazon. Papros Corazon from the Philippines. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's too many names in a row. I know Cora very well. This is ridiculous. Anyway, so if any of you would like to say a few extra words as contributors, please say so. That's actually easier than raising your hand for me. I just want to say thank you from an Australian feminist. Thank you. <gasps> thank you, Fraser. That's me. I, I don't I want to miss that on saying thank you. Privilege. And my Felix, privilege. Um, um, that uh, she has written a very moving book when her uh, child died in childbirth and she was then accused of actually having murdered her child and it oh. took three years and she was absolutely uh, you know taken through every possible and impossible process and um, it's it's the book is called Still no, born, Sorry, still. born still a memoir um, a memoir of grief by Janet Fraser so um, if you haven't read it yet um, it, it would move your heart as well to I read will, it. I will. and, and here you. is a picture of uh, Janet's book uh, I don't know if you can see that yeah, you can. Uh, yeah. that that is one of the covers that Estelle Dish has done in the series of the spin effect shorts <sighs> So much talent. <laughs> Do you want to say a few words about your piece and Rita Arditi, please? Well, it was Rita left terrific projects for me. She had interviewed 20 of the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo and mm -hmm. never told me what to do with the tapes. So I went to Argentina and I talked to the grandmothers and we worked out that I would listen to the tapes, digitize them take out anything that the interviewee defined as not for the book that Rita wrote about them and then put them on the web. So anybody who knows Spanish can listen to those 20 interviews that Rita did. And then she had metastatic breast cancer. You're dropping out this has, down your sound. Okay, I, I think garbage truck just went by, it's gone. Um, 
she had metastatic breast cancer for over 30 years and wanted to write her cancer story. Ran out of time, so I did that and put it on the website for her. So I tell I tell that story in my piece in the book. And Rita's own memoir was always going to be called Not Dead Yet because someone walked up to her a few years after her cancer diagnosis and said to her, oh, I thought you were dead. So I love that the title of this new book is that title. Estelle, so, can you tell us where, where the blog can be found with the, with the interviews? Uh, RitaArditi.com, R-I-T-A-A-R-D-I-T-T-I. Maybe Renat or Sue could put that in the chat because I'm walking. Okay. Um, and, and Estelle's uh, photographs, which are truly beautiful, can be found at www.estelledish.com. And that is also in the book, uh, but I'll put it up as well. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, Estelle. It's really quite a, it's a, it's, a commitment to be a, able to do that. It's been a pleasure. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, anybody else have a question um, or comments or whatever? I want to say very briefly to terrorist that uh, the word testeria I have found very useful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That must be in uh, the dictionary, yes? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> there are some wonderful dictionaries around actually, done by different women at different times. So, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, if nobody has any more questions or comments, if you do have a question, quick Jump in, say it, unmute yourself, say it, and if not, we will finish uh, Finish up. Um, get, Nala, get, get Nala up so people can see her. Nala, come here. Come on, she's just destroyed the tissue down here. No, she doesn't want to come. Come on. Can I just say thank you to everybody who spoke? It's been wonderful. I love the gallery view. We can see everybody and then the speaker view. It's been a wonderful um, uh, gathering this morning. Uh, well, I'm speaking from the Wandry country of uh, uh, in Melbourne, Australia, so or better known as NAM these days. So thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to Renata and uh, Susan for setting it all up. And I look forward to the next one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> a uh, marathon attender. Uh, <laughs> and if you can see me, you'll be now be able to see Nala, the singing dog. Um, she's sort very of, cute. yeah, yeah. <laughs> put the screen down a bit. Uh, okay, putting the screen down a bit. Yes, much better. Yes. I can't oh. see myself for some reason. Uh, so, yep. So, okay. thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. So, thank you to Spin Effects for 30 years of inspiring feminist um, publishing. Um, the, our need to know our own history is much enhanced by all the work you've done. You're one of the few publishers that keep a backlist. Uh, where we can actually find books. Um, imagine having books that have been in print for 30 years. Surely this deserves a, uh, a medal in some award system that we're not watching <laughs> in the history of suppressions. Um, Cheris, it's been lovely to hear you today because I have my dictionary here. It's by my computer where I write. And I, I always just, every time I get annoyed, I go to it and I find the definition. <laughs> <laughs> that I want. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. Yeah. Um, and there are so many things that spin effects have done, which I think are sometimes we, we just take for granted. And I just want to pay tribute to um, the way in which they've pioneered uh, moral rights for authors uh, and their contributors. And I'm somebody who works in a collaborative mode with Indigenous women. And the fact that I'm able to assure them that once they've told me their story, it hasn't been appropriated. It remains theirs. Um, and that is noted on the on the book. And that is something that that Sue really pursued very heavily. So I thank both Renata and Sue for paying attention to those kind of details, legalistic details, which it's so easy to um, kind of pass over 
in our ethical attempts to um, bring women's stories into the public without diminishing the standing of the women whose stories we wish to uh, share. So thank you. I, I want to chime in also that thank you, Diane, because I wanted to say the same thing to give tribute to Spinifex, the women of Spinifex, and their commitment also to international feminism because this has been such a fundamental part of your contribution, Susan and Renata, is you know the, the, the networks that you've created and the elevation of women's voices from so many countries, you know, and just, just core feminism. Thank yeah. you. Yes. And I, I you. used oh, sorry. Go ahead. Renata's work when I was teaching ecofeminism because I did a whole a whole section on surrogacy and I and it was all from Finn Rage and Renata's books and Gina Correa's books and it was you know Spinifex has been a great um, resource and it doesn't seem to be anything else like it anymore. Well, that's why we can't be not dead yet. So, you know, we have to continue. <laughs> um, I just want to say uh, thank you, first of all, to everybody who said these nice things. And of course, it's not just Susan and I who are doing these books. We are together. We have a very wonderful team. And um, the women who work at Spinifex 7 at the moment uh, have been with us for a very long time. So I really want to acknowledge Marilyn Damiano, the office manager, um, and Sharon, who also uh, does the warehouse manager, uh, Pauline Hopkins, who is our editor and event organizer, uh, Rachel McDermott, who is a fantastic publicist, and Kathleen uh, Roper, who does the social media. And really, without you, we simply could not do it, could not have done it, could not do it, and Will not would not be able to continue. So thank you to all of you from our hearts. And thank you to Renata for having the idea for this book. <laughs> yes, that's been, I've wanted to do this for a very long time. So I'm very happy that it's finally come out and very happy with the book. Okay, well, um, as I said before, the video of this launch will be online next week there'll be something on the Facebook page or if you go back to the the website you'll see the link um, thanks to Rachel who knows how to do things like this uh, and if you want to come to another launch then on the 19th of August we will have uh, Sheila Jeffries, Lynn Hahn, Linda Burke, Elaine Hutton and Linda Bellos from the UK and from um, Chile, but speaking from the UK, will be Consuelo Rivera Fuentes. And from New Zealand, but speaking from Denmark, will be Alison Laurie. So that's on the 19th of August. So look out for it or tell your friends in, in Europe, um, because it might be a hard time for the US in terms of the time of day. But you will also be able to see that online afterwards if you can't do it or is it some ungodly ungodly hour well thank you thank you so very much to all of our speakers phyllis chesler peggy laws evelyn Ackard, max dashu margui bellotti estelle dish sheris kramer and also uh, jean and diane um, for uh, your comments at the end and and we are still alive we do continue we've got some marvelous books coming up later this year and uh, when we get over these launches, I'll finish the catalogue. Uh, so thank you very, very much and goodbye from Australia. <laughs>